EMS spectrum. So, and, and actually it's interesting because my slides may be a little bit old because Carla's numbers were actually showing even more, uh, you know, robust expenditures across the globe. In the US, we spend about $1.3 trillion a year on CNS disorders. Fewer than 50% of people with these disorders are, are actually being timely, having timely diagnosis uh, and, and effective and accurate treatments. Uh, around the world, it's like fewer than uh, 20%. So there's, a, so there's a huge need. Carla talked about the need, uh, and, and Jeff Lieberman, Jeffrey Lieberman is actually one of our advisors and is on our board. Um, you know, and the Jeff Lieberman quote is actually really very interesting because it, beyond you know the need that we see on a regular basis, there are in in our country there are what we call deserts of care. There are just areas where you just can't find a psychiatrist or a therapist. I make a joke to, with our with our VCs and when when I'm pitching the company that you know there, you can't throw a rock and not hit a therapist in San Francisco, but not the same in Alabama. Right? And not the same in Susanville. You get outside of these urban areas uh, and, and we're just looking at, at, at a desert of care. There are very few new drug therapies on the market uh, right now. So the, 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 our pharma friends that are here in the audience, um, the pipeline, you know, and these drugs as we know can take many years to actually be run through their control trials. But very few things in the pharma pipeline right now around neuro and, and psychiatry. Uh, and, and another thing that's actually kind of even driving things is we've had you know, the Affordable Care Act and the Mental Health uh, Parity and, uh, and Addiction Equity Act, which was written by Patrick Kennedy, who is one of the founders of our company uh, when he was congressman of Rhode Island, uh, went, both went into effect in 2013. Uh, so kind of forcing payers and insurance companies to cover mental health. That same year, the WHO actually focused on, on mental health as you know, its primary cause for concern. Uh, and, and what you saw in some of Carla's numbers were, were WHO reports that suggest the costs of this, uh, of mental health specifically, are $2.5 trillion worldwide and will be $6 trillion by 2030. So the numbers are phenomenal. Across the board, we break this down into a, you know, a number of different diseases. Uh, and we look at you know global population for these. As I mentioned earlier, uh, approximately 80% of the world market for brain-related treatments is currently either un underserved or unserved. And it just goes on. When we when we get down into the mix of specifically to mental health, uh, this is out of an Economist article uh, where mental illness is the the single most expensive aspect of healthcare outside of uh, uh, out of non-communicable diseases. So these are phenomenal numbers, and and there's you know th there's a causality and a, and a correlation between mental health issues and other healthcare issues, right? And so you know uh, I'm 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 not a, a, a scientist, and you know the scientists will refrain from you know saying cause and effect, uh, but there are definitely correlations between mental health issues uh, and everything from obesity and diabetes uh, to even cancer, and we actually even see. Um, you know, more effective treatments uh, for things like cancer when people are being treated for the mental health issues that come along with that. So we feel that the time is right to develop uh, solutions for this. And the solutions that Pair Therapeutics has put together are these drug software combinations. I mentioned that we have our e-formulations uh, platform and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And, and this, this slide is a little bit of an eye chart, and um, we, we do actually have an, an app for uh, visual cortex training, but uh, I won't make you read all of that. <laughs> the, the main points here is that the market needs solutions, right? We have this desert of need, we've got ongoing uh, costs. Uh, and when you add in the neurological aspects, I was chatting with some folks earlier that you know, we're seeing this, uh, you know, what, our, what our chief science officer calls a tsunami of neurological disease that is heading our way with our aging population. Uh, so there, the, the market needs solutions. We need scalable, repeatable, affordable solutions out there. <coughs> the market's also ready, right? You know, we all have these smartphones in our pockets that are basically little supercomputers. You know, the first computers that I worked on uh, long ago when I started the Multimedia Studies program had so much less power than my phone does today, right? And these are in the hands of huge portions of the population. We have an app that's going to be coming, I'll talk a little bit about it, for patients with schizophrenia. And in that patient population set, 
They have an installed base of smartphones at just under neurotypical populations. So it's about a 78% penetration of smartphones in patients with schizophrenia. So they're out there, right? People have these devices, they have access, uh, and we need to be able to take advantage of it. And, and the technology is mature, and there's a number of different technologies that are mature, right? Not only the smartphone technology, but things like my watch, right? The wearables, um, affective measures that we're looking at, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're integrating affective measures and more objective measures and bringing that to bear into mental health. Where the, where the, in, in the standard right now are, are really very subjective, um, patients telling uh, clinicians how they feel and, and clinicians uh, via some you know, more rigorous tests uh, making assessments there. So digital health is really an effective means of delivering these, uh, these therapeutics and these technologies. Uh, on this slide I've got three examples of things that uh, in the recent past um, th th this game uh, for, that made the cover of Nature magazine was developed at UCSF. Uh, one of our investors and advisors, um, Adam Gazali, runs the Gazali lab there uh, at, at UC. Uh, he and his team put together this game called Neuro Racer. Um, the article basically goes on uh, to talk about if this was a drug, it would be a billion dollar drug. Right? Because neuroplasticity works, right? We can actually retrain our brains in the same way that we can use exercise and train our bodies. Um, you know, now neuroplasticity is a little bit of a double-edged sword, and I'll get into that in a minute. But these things actually work, and and a number of these have been run through random control trials. And so we're not making assumptions that it works. We're not making hypotheses. We're not really looking to sell, um, you know, hope and placebos. Uh, these things are being run through random control trials with the same rigor that, uh, that medical devices and pharmaceuticals are. Um, when Carla was asking, what industry are you in, and she said medical device, I raised my hand for that uh, because we actually um, submit our apps to the FDA, and it's basically we submit to the FDA under uh, CFR 8211, which is software as a medical device. So our uh, applications are considered medical devices. So, you know, quick overview of, of my company and what we're really currently doing. Uh, we are, uh, as I mentioned, a venture-funded firm. We've got uh, approximately 40 people on our team. Our clinical and regulatory teams are in Boston, uh, and I've built our product design and engineering teams here in San Francisco. We're just right around the corner, so this is an easy commute for me. We've built an, uh, an e-formulations platform uh, so we're, we're really looking at, with the e-formulations platform, to combine um, digital therapeutics with, with pharmaceuticals, with traditional approaches. We are not looking to disintermediate the doctors. We're not looking to disintermediate the clinicians or the pharmaceutical companies. Our belief is that drug plus app is better than drug alone, and it's better than app alone. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and we've got some IP, uh, blocking IP around that. We also, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're really very focused on clinical data, so we're developing and running our own trials, but we've also in-licensed a number of digital therapeutics that have been developed with your and my tax dollars. Uh, you know, DOD and DARPA and, and the government has spent a lot of money doing research around um, a, a number of digital therapeutics. Uh, and in a lot of these cases, you know, the, the, the proof is that the research works and then, and then it sits on a shelf. We in-license these technologies to bring them to market, to, to make them scalable, to make them HIPAA compliant and fully secure with end-to-end -end encryption. And, and so what we're, what we're really looking to do is to kind of, you know, bring more of these things to market on top of our platform uh, so that we have a, a, larger, a larger scale and a larger reach. We submitted our first product reset, which is for addiction substance use disorder uh, to the FDA this year. It was a de novo. Uh, and, and our, so I, I know everybody knows what a 510K is, right, to, to be submitted. Have you ever done a de novo? Yeah. I, I know people that have been in the pharma industry for 30 years and they've never done a de novo. A de novo is when you don't have any predicate. It, was, it weighed like 26.3 pounds. It, it was you know, 1,568 pages, and so it was a, it was a, a huge undertaking, uh, but we're very proud of that, and we're, we're really very much focused on, uh, on having the validation that FDA approval gives us. So the platform really is that you know, we're identifying medications with clinical benefits, we're adding a digital therapeutic to enhance the medication efficacy, 
uh, and, and that there's a synergistic effect, right? In, especially in mental health, the gold standard is, you know, face-to-face -face therapy and an antidepressant. Um, and now, for a number of different reasons, this is challenging. It's not scalable. Payers don't want to pay for uh, as much therapy as people, clinicians, and, and the patients feel that they need. Uh, it's not repeatable. There are a number of other friction points in this therapy as well. Uh, and so we're looking to really, you know, uh, bring, bring the, these worlds together. And as I said, we're not looking to remove the face-to-face -face therapy. We're looking to enhance it. Uh, to be able to cut down the number of hours or minutes that are spent face to face and to offer the patient an anytime, anywhere access to the therapeutic that they may need. Uh, so uh, the team that we put together uh, includes our, our health and, uh, and regulatory folks uh, that are mostly out of our Boston office. Uh, and this is my team here in San Francisco that I pulled together. Uh, so we have folks that are as diverse as, you know, a couple of MDs. Uh, and, uh, and folks like Marty Kaplan, who has developed like 28 games, including BioWare and games for Sega and EA, because we're really looking to bring together these worlds of, of entertainment and, and healthcare with the rigors of science behind it. Uh, one of the reasons that we're hiring out of like the entertainment and game space is because Hollywood knows how to influence our emotions, right? And Las Vegas knows how to motivate our behavior. You know, so there's repeatable stickiness that these two organizations really know really well. And if we can harness that energy in the healthcare space, then we think that we'll have something really powerful to bring to bear. In addition to our team that works with us every day, we've developed a, a board of advisors. I mentioned Jeffrey Lieberman. Um, Patrick Kennedy uh, and, and across the board we're really looking uh, and, and work with I was I was sharing with Mimi earlier we're very interested in working with clinicians uh, we're very interested in, in working with you know the key opinion leaders um, that that really understand uh, the patient needs uh, and their own needs as well right you know it's interesting uh, because a lot of times you know we think primarily of the patient but these clinicians are being overwhelmed uh, I was just at Kaiser the other day, and they were uh, they were they were sharing with me that at a point in the past they were expected to see 45 patients a day. It's phenomenal. Uh, I don't know how anybody could do this, right? And uh, and and so the, they're they're feeling overwhelmed, and so you know we're really very much looking to work with uh, the the installed base, the installed ecosystem, uh, to you know facilitate the the improvement of, of delivery of care. Uh, so I mentioned that we have a number of patents uh, around drug software combinations. Um, our patents cover everything from mental uh, to behavioral health. Uh, so behavioral health includes things like COPD, uh, cardiology, diabetes, obesity. Uh, we're really focusing on mental health for a number of different reasons. Um, it, primarily, uh, it, there is this huge need, right, that's out there that we've already identified. Uh, there's, you know, there's the, the market need, the scalability need, uh, and, and also, you know, there's really nobody, uh, you know, finally and, and, and homely focusing uh, on these mental health issues. So we, in our approach, you know, I mentioned before, drug plus app is better than app alone and better than drug alone. We're really looking to leverage neuroplasticity, right? And by combining these two things uh, and enabling the patient, and across a, a, a couple of different disciplines, right? We're looking at medical literacy. We're looking at medication compliance. We look at uh, contingency management, which actually offers rewards to patients for doing well. Um, that we're, we're looking to bring to bear. But all of this is in, in combination to, you know, facilitate the patient and the clinician to help the patient move through their disorder. So the platform that we've created uh, is, you know, it is just that, right? So our, our, our platform enables us to stand up uh, apps and games uh, that have end-to-end -end encryption, that are HIPAA compliant, uh, and regulated, uh, you know, we, we abide all the HIPAA standards. Uh, we, we have regular audits with, uh, with co fire as well as our pharmaceutical partners as well. And this is enabling us to stand up, um, you know, to really what, what we're hoping to do is to kind of spin one app up after another and build out the team so that we'll have a, a, a panoply of applications. Uh, one of the things that we know about mental health too is there's a lot of comorbidity there. So with every app that we spin up, uh, we can learn and leverage that for the next that, that are coming along. 
So really what we're looking to do here, uh, and I mentioned all of this, and so you, you, you'll see these chevrons, right, in a lot of, if you go to JP Morgan, the health investing conference, right, they're, they're really famous for one chevron leads to the other, right, and they're looking at value creation uh, for this. Um, but we're, we're very much taking the approach of, of you know, as, as I mentioned, structured data, standard, standard clinical approach uh, to uh, how, we're, how we're approaching this market. So our platform enables us to do a number of different things um, across the different etiologies. Uh, one is data visualization. This is both data viz for the patients, right, so that they can see their progress and, and mark their own progress, um, and, and as well as data viz for the clinicians, right? We want to offer our clinicians and, and clinical end users uh, with a snapshot view of how their patient is doing. Uh, the other is you know standard onboarding and uh, and security as I mentioned, and then things that are also standard across uh, mental health issues, uh, things like notifications, pushed assessments, uh, and those types of things uh, that that are all in, uh, enhanced via the platform. Uh, so some of the products that we're working on, I mentioned that we submitted um, our substance use disorder product uh, to the FDA. We're currently working on. So a, a lot of uh, the, these products will be kind of a family of products. Uh, I was sharing with some folks earlier that a lot of these disorders and diseases, and, and, and Mimi will, I'm sure, be able to talk to this, are, um, are very heterogeneous. Right? You know, when we started working on substance use disorder, you know, some of the engineers that work with me were saying, do addicts have phones? <coughs> Yes. <laughs> How do you think they call the drug dealer? <laughs> but, uh, but beyond that, I mean, you know, something like addiction is Winston Churchill and Robert Downey Jr. and the guy on Mission in Second, right? I mean, you know, both of these people know it, but it looks very different in these cases. Um, Michonne and I were talking earlier about, you know, the, the, the heterogeneity of, of schizophrenia, which is uh, one of the next apps, uh, and we're already working on that. Uh, in, in our pipeline. So these are all, you know, really very different uh, disorders and diseases. So we do have a, a full pipeline of products uh, that we're working on. And, and as you can tell, you know, things that, that we're working on are, are really um, on the clinical side of things. Um, we, we do have uh, some wellness apps. Uh, oh, and this gets into, and I know I'm going a little long here. This gets into um, uh, a little bit more of our addiction app. Uh, one, one thing I'll say about the addiction app is that uh, it's, it's got 10 years of clinical data behind it. Uh, the p-value for the outcomes is phenomenal. And I'll give you one data point that is really, I, I, I think, just moving to me. In the most reticent and the most challenging population set in this random controlled trial, there was an all-comers trial that was funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. So the most reticent patients are those that show up on the first day of the trial, and their UDS on that first day shows that they still have drugs in their body that day. Right? So they're starting the trial still high. So these are very challenging patients. And, and as we know that you know, addiction is a, a lifelong and relapsing disease and disorder, and if you're starting the trial still high, your chances are not you know, uh, really good of, of lasting. With that patient population set, we had a 10x improvement over treatment as usual. So the, the p-value numbers are phenomenal, and you can see some of those here um, that, you know, non-abstinent at start uh, and, and where they ended up. So we're very excited about the data. We're very excited about the possibility of these products. I'm just going to move through some of these really quickly here. Um, you know, I mentioned that we'll, we'll have a family of products. Uh, Reset O is for opiate use disorder. Uh, that's our next product that's coming. It's going to be a combination product with an agonist, partial agonist called buprenorphine. Uh, and then, you know, we're also uh, currently working on our product for patients with schizophrenia. Uh, with all of these products, we have experts that we work with uh, with our schizophrenia product. Um, it was originally developed out of the Dartmouth Center for Medical Innovation uh, at the M Health, you know, Mobile Health for Mental Health initiative that was started by Dr. Dror Benzeev. Uh, Dror is actually uh, works with us on a, uh, on a regular basis uh, on bringing this product to market. And similarly, you know, uh, good data coming out of, of Drawer's products. Uh, we've got a number of products in the pipeline, as I mentioned. Uh, I talked a little bit about the platform, and I'm happy to, you know, talk with, with anybody uh, a, a little bit further. Uh, I don't want to cut into to Mimi's time here. Um, uh, 
A quick aside here, I mentioned pr previously uh, that we're looking at affective uh, and objective measures for mental health, and there are a number of these that we're really very excited about. Uh, M3 Clinician actually is a more standard assessment uh, that we'll push to patients uh, via the mobile app. Uh, it measures for comorbidities uh, in, in four different areas. It looks at uh, bipolar, um, let's see, it's PTSD, a PTSD. Um, bipolar disorder, post, uh, PTSD, and also it, it takes it into account addiction as well, doesn't it? No, it actually it doesn't. So we're we're late, we're we're first embodying it with our addiction product because the the, the so comorbidities. Depression, anxiety, it is PTSD, and and, and bipolar. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And and then you know in addition to that, you know there are a number of affective systems that are using the camera on your phone to look at your face or the the voice recorder, the microphone to measure your voice. Um, as, as you know, people know, uh, with the depression disorder, you know, people, or, or even with schizophrenia, you'll have a flat affect. Um, the, you know, the voice will be more monotone. Uh, and uh, Beyond Verbal is one of the groups that we've worked with. Uh, Kajito, which is out of, uh, out of the Boston area, is another group that we've worked with. Uh, they've developed algorithms that can actually test for, um, you know, and, and register levels of, of anxiety and depression on people using affective measure. So the, the platform that we've developed, uh, we're, we're also using it in a subclinical space. Uh, we've got a number of products that, we're de that we've developed. Um, this is really basically our, our R&D platform. Um, so we're, you know, as I mentioned, the, a lot of these disorders are on a spectrum. So where we're able to test for, you know, does this uh, app for mood uh, work in a subclinical area? Might we want to try it and run a trial uh, in a clinical area? Um, we can get some great data to, you know, to run some pilots. All of these apps are based on, uh, on, on clinical uh, and scientific research. Uh, so for example, our app for mood disorder is called uh, Vita Apps Happy. Uh, it uses cognitive bias modification training uh, that Tracy Dennis uh, and, and, a, and a woman named Dr. Lee uh, out, of, um, uh, out of Stanford have, have both shown in some of their work uh, that can actually uh, both uh, help people with depression as well as anxiety. So these apps were live in 2015. Uh, we're actually going to be relaunching them uh, with a large supplement partner. And again, so it's around this idea of e-formulations where we'll be able to, unlike our, our FDA and clinical apps, where you can't just push things out over the market, right, in the clinical, in the clinical world. Uh, with our subclinical products, we'll, we'll be able to test and run A-B <laughs> tests in the same way that we would for a game company or an app company. So really, we're looking to develop a differentiated solution for CNS. Uh, you know, as I said, we're not looking to disintermediate clinicians or pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we're, we're looking to integrate and work uh, within the ecosystem as it exists to provide uh, enhanced solutions across the board. And the final thing I wanna say is we're hiring. Uh, we closed an A round uh, and uh, we're, we're definitely looking to expand the team uh, and, and grow uh, so that we can actually knock down that pipeline. Thank you.